The goal of quantitative research, and research generally, is to make better evidence-based decisions and guide further study. To achieve these goals, you have to be able to communicate effectively through your writing and presentation. If your writing is too verbose, convoluted, or too long, you'll lose your reader and not achieve these goals. Empirical writing can be very difficult. The great majority of scientists have not been trained to write. They're scientists, they're not trained to write. And so what they do, the great majority of them, is to look at how other scientists write by downloading a scientific paper and reading that paper, uh, and then to, to mimic it as best they can. And that, you can imagine, a sort of self-perpetuating cycle because the people that they are mimicking probably didn't know how to write either, and so they were just mimicking somebody else and that kind of thing. So, so I would say that, you know, chances are the most scientific papers out there that you download are probably not great examples of writing. We're going to show you how to structure your presentations and help you focus on precise, concise writing to effectively tell the story that you've developed through your quantitative research. Your story, your research, if it is written and presented well, may help others make better decisions and guide future research. A research poster is a visual communication tool that allows you to present your research in a clear, concise, graphic format. It attracts attention, conveys information clearly, and initiates conversations. The, the objective of a poster is to get somebody to stop and talk to you about what you've done. It's not to communicate every little detail of the experiment and all of your findings. Typically posters are presented at a conference and so people are circulating looking at posters. They don't have a ton of time, they want to glance quickly at it, figure out what you did, and then see if they want to stop and talk with you and ask you questions. So the, the less daunting you can make your poster, the, the more likely somebody's going to stop and, and talk with you about it. When writing about empirical research for a presentation or poster, there are generally six sections. Title, introduction, Research question, which can be included at the end of the introduction. Methodology. Results. Discussion. These six sections will help you organize your thoughts in writing. You can use them as the headings of an outline or storyboard. I think it's particularly important in science to map out your story. How do you get from A to B to C? Because if you haven't thought that out clearly in your head, then you're never going to be able to put it on the page clearly. And so you may not want to outline it. You might need to just scribble diagrams and you can you know, draw a box with what happens at A and how do you get from A to B to C, et cetera. So sort of whatever works for them. So I think that's sort of the, the first most important step is to have some kind of storyboard for how you're planning to bring the reader or in the case of a poster, the viewer from the beginning to the end. And then I guess what I would say would be to simplify it as much as possible. So people tend to think that science needs to be complex and that you have to use these big words in order to get your point across. But I think the, the, the opposite is true. You have to use the right words, but the simpler you can make it and the fewer words in which you can say it, the easier it is for people to follow what you're saying or writing. An hourglass shape is a good metaphor to guide you in your writing. The width of the glass represents the breadth of your writing. Wider at the beginning and end, and narrower in the middle. You begin by introducing, begin broad, by introducing statements, broad statements, narrow, narrow your focus to specific, to specific methodologies, methodologies and conclusions, and then broaden and then again, broaden to, again discuss the to discuss the general significance and implications of your work. Thus, Thus the, beginning the beginning of your introduction and, and the end of your, end of your discussion, discussion should contain your broadest statements. statements. And the, and the methodology and results, and results section, section should contain your, should most, contain specific your most specific statements. So you start big and broad, you need to tell people the significance, the background, why it matters, and then you sort of hone in on what exactly you tested and the specific results that you found, but then you need to go back out to the why we care, which is the, the broader context. The title summarizes the main idea of your research question. It should be a concise statement of the main topic and should identify the actual variables under investigation and the relationship between them. A title should be fully explanatory when standing alone. You should avoid words that serve no useful purpose. For example, the words method and results do not normally appear in a title, 
nor should such redundancies as a study of or an experimental investigation of begin a title. One of the most common things I think is overusing complex words. I think, it, I think often it's for the sake of trying to sound like a scientist, which you can imagine, right, and we've probably all been there, it feels like an important thing to do, that you need to sound like the writing that you've seen before. Students will often write things like, the treatment caused a statistically significant increase in blood pressure. And it sounds scientific because you're saying statistically significant and there's the treatment and it's causing this, but really what you mean is that the treatment increased blood pressure. So it's far fewer words, it says the same thing in the statistically significant term, um, which sounds so important, really is kind of like overkill. If you're a scientist, you wouldn't say that it increased blood pressure if it didn't actually increase blood pressure, statistically speaking, so you can kind of just leave that part out. In this course, you're using observational rather than experimental data, so be careful not to use causal language. For example, the impact of, the effect of, etc. As you'll recall from the previous video, correlation does not necessarily imply causation, so it's critically important not to overstate your findings. Finally, avoid using abbreviations in a title. The final title for our sample project is The Association Between Smoking Quantity and Nicotine Dependence Among Young Adults with and Without Psychiatric Disorders. Here you can see that we describe the association we're looking at, the sample, that is young adults, and also the third variables, that is psychiatric disorders, that play an important role in terms of answering our specific research question. Below the title, include your name and where the work was conducted. The introduction describes the background for the question you intend to investigate. And if it is an area you know or have read about, it would introduce how your research relates to other work in the field. If your topic is not something you know or have read about, it is still important to provide whatever context you're able to. Introductory statements introduce your topic and rationale for study, but are accessible to both specialists and non-specialists. Successful opening statements gradually introduce your topic with examples and explicit, if non-technical, definitions of critical terms. The introduction is an argument that sets the stage for your research question, and modeling the top of an hourglass, it goes from the general to the specific. The introduction includes what is known about a topic. These statements are highlighted here in red. Also included in the introduction is what is not known, highlighted in green. And finally, we typically include what our study may contribute, highlighted in purple. All of this background sets up our research question. We include nothing extra. We want a reader to be interested in knowing more so we try to be very concise. Each word counts. And we also aim to be jargon free. Not surprisingly in scientific writing, if we're describing the previous work of other researchers, we also need to include citations for that work, often with the full bibliography listed at the end of the poster. With less knowledge of previous literature, I might instead include this as my introduction. So in both cases, you can see that we're introducing the topic by first describing what we believe to be known, followed by what may be unknown, and what our study may shed light on. At the end of the introduction, or directly following the introduction, as shown, we next include our research questions. In our research example, questions include, which psychiatric disorders are associated with nicotine dependence? And secondly, does the association between amounts smoked and nicotine dependence differ for individuals with and without a psychiatric disorder? The method section describes how the research was conducted. It includes descriptions of your sample, measures, and procedures. In the sample section, identify who or what was studied, people, animals, etc. 
If you group observations, use meaningful names like low-income fathers rather than abbreviations like LI fathers or labels like control group. It can also be helpful to describe the procedures. Explain what participants experienced or what was observed. Discuss whether data were collected by surveillance, survey, case study, or another method. It's also important to mention observations excluded from your analyses, if any. In the measures portion of the methods section, describe the measures, that is variables or survey items, for your participants or observations. This is a very brief but successful measures section. The results section presents our univariate, bivariate, and any multivariate results. Here's what we found. We include a graph to illustrate the relationship between cigarettes smoked and nicotine dependence for those with major depression and those without major depression. As you can see, while rates of nicotine dependence increased as smoking quantity increased for both groups, young adult smokers with major depression have higher rates of nicotine dependence at every level of smoking compared to young adult smokers without major depression. This pattern was also found for specific phobia and antisocial personality disorder as illustrated by this graph. We illustrate this statistical interaction showing that at lower levels of smoking, individuals with alcohol dependence have substantially elevated rates of nicotine dependence compared to those without alcohol dependence, while at the highest levels of smoking, Rates of nicotine dependence are statistically similar for those with and without alcohol dependence. When completing your results section, it's important to keep the most pertinent results and to remove everything that is not absolutely necessary. You want to think about the most attractive way to present the data and figures. And generally, try to avoid tables if at all possible. Remember that your graphs or figures should include a clear title and that your X and Y axes should be clearly labeled. The final section of your presentation is the discussion section. It's important that this section includes real implications linked to results and not merely a restatement of your research question. This is a very important section of the research presentation and sometimes best written after you've had a few days to step away from your project and allow yourself to put your question and possible answers into some context. In our example, we interpret the meaning of the results, the strengths of the study, limitations of our study, and recommendations for future research. If you feel that your findings have immediate implications, you should also include those. And remember this is the bottom of the hourglass and should proceed from the more specific to the most general statements. What the study showed was that HIV rate um, is overall is not significantly correlated to life expectancy in Latin American countries. However, it is significantly correlated in the lowest income group. Here are just a few more final tips that you may find useful. First, avoid surprises. Lead your reader through your presentation and avoid jumping around in your story. Prepare your presentation for a diverse audience and make a special effort to frame your question and results in an understandable and interesting way. Be brief. Distill down, down, down to the very essence of your research. Use a figure or graph where possible. Graphics are good attention getters. But remember the golden rule of figures and graphs in that they must be understandable without reference to accompanying text. And here are some pitfalls. Too much text. Keep each text box to just a few sentences. 
If you leave out key elements such as objectives, methods, or conclusions, people who are not insiders to your subject will not understand what your goal was or why it's interesting. And finally, poor figures can be a big problem. Some figures are real puzzles with incomprehensible legends, secret codes, small lettering, cryptic captions, etc. Some statistical programs do not produce reader-friendly graphics, so you need to plan a little extra time to customize your figures so that they are self-explanatory. Your research is telling a story, and your poster presentation is an important part of communicating that story to others.